Okay, good morning. We've been talking about carbohydrates and um, very important biomolecules, as the last section of the text uh, will cover, will give you an introduction really to what's to come if you're going into the biosciences. And chemistry wise, you saw that the chemistry is reasonably limited, and we've already covered it, except that it's got a it's got the, action, the additional twist of being polyfunctional. So we have a polyhydroxy carbonyl type scenario. We have the possibility of making intramolecular hemiacetals. Uh, and we have basically then just redox chemistry and protection chemistry. So we can oxidize the alcohols. We can oxidize aldehydes. We can reduce the aldehydes. Uh, and then we can look at... Uh, uh, things like ether formation and uh, ester formation. Uh, the polyfunctional nature comes in because we have an aldehyde and we have alcohols and we have a hemiacetal. And hemiacetals, as you know, we can turn over to acetals. So it's old chemistry as applied to a new system. So it serves as a review, serves to reinforce what you've learned earlier, hopefully. And then we have the added twist of having intramolecular uh, reactivity. Uh, the only other aspect that we've emphasized, and this is where Fisher projections came in, so we reviewed Fisher projections, was symmetry. And the symm symmetry relationships, when you symmetrize top and bottom, when you make both functional groups at the end of, a, of an aldose or ketose the same, uh, you have to look for uh, symmetry relationships with respect to the stereocenters. So there, there can be meso compounds, which would be optically inactive, or just based on the symmetry of the molecule, C2 symmetry, rotational symmetry, which makes this thing still chiral, but it's, uh, it's got NMR-type symmetry. So we can look uh, for that. In nature, as I said, there are abundant. And uh, one of the major features of sugars is their energy content and their ease of uh, metabolism. And so they're the perfect fuels. Uh, another aspect is uh, recognition. Uh, all our cells uh, are covered with the particular sugar molecules. And because of hydrogen bonding, incoming um, uh, species that would like to get into the cell or the cell would like to pull in will first have to pass the, uh, the password, as it were, uh, namely, will it be recognized by the first uh, uh, line of, uh, of recognition, which is the sugar uh, layer. Uh, where this is becomes, for example, very important is in, um, in blood types. Okay? We all have various blood types, A, B, and so forth. And uh, that is primarily due to the fact that you have uh, different sugar coding. Okay? Um, and then, energy storage, we started looking at how uh, uh, nature uh, uses glucose to store uh, and, uh, and then uh, use it in a variety of ways, not only just storage. Uh, one of the things that it does, it makes uh, polymers, and it's interesting that glucose features uh, very dominantly in all of these biopolymers based on sugars. And part of this, uh, undoubtedly, is the fact that glucose has the stereochemistry that allows it in the uh, cyclic pyranose form, in the hemiacetal form, to have everything uh, equatorial. Okay, so this is a very stable arrangement. Uh, notice that, as we notice in terms of oxidizing the aldehyde function in aldoses, that, of course, sugars are intrinsically reactive. And even air, aldehydes are unstable to air slowly, and even air will oxidize uh, aldehydes slowly to the corresponding carboxylic acids. So as a storage device, glucose itself is not useful, or any other sugar that has a reducing, uh, can, can be reduced, uh, can be oxidized, so it has a reducing uh, function. So what nature does very cleverly, it blocks the hemiacetal function by making an acetal. Uh, we saw already a very good example of that with table sugar. Brilliantly, in table sugar, glucose and fructose block each other by making an ether link. You 
using the hemiacetal hydroxy of both of them. Okay? So they make an acetal that's an acetal to the sugar as well as an acetal to the fructose. And that stabilizes the molecule, and so it's perfectly air stable. As you all know, sugar can be you know, bought and kept for months and years, and it doesn't degrade. But in fact, if it were uh, to be yeah, the yeah, free yeah, aldehyde, yeah. it would oxidize uh, over a period of months or so, okay, and probably turn colored and, and so on. So here's a, a, another example. This is a polymer, and this is cellulose. We stopped uh, here last week on this. Uh, and uh, I briefly mentioned, although we rushed to this a little bit, so I'm going to do it again, that this is a polyglucose in which the uh, hemi uh, acetal function is blocked by making a bridge to the equatorial OH at C4 of another glucose molecule. Okay? So we have this equatorial OH of this molecule blocks the hemiacetal function, which is also equatorial. So it's a di-equatorial form uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, linkage. And it uses the beta or equatorial OH of the hemiacetal. So this goes up to about 3,000 uh, units uh, molecular weight of the order of 500,000. You can imagine a long, uh, long chain. And this is one way to store very efficiently, of course, a lot of energy. And then enzymes can uh, uh, start uh, hydrolyzing here and liberating uh, the uh, individual glucose molecules and then they are reactive and they get metabolized and do check, whatever check one they, they need to do. Ah. Um, another aspect of this, which we haven't talked that much about, but clearly, since this, these molecules are polyols, they all are capable of hydrogen bonding. And nature uses that to the hilt. In a polymer like this, this is basically a long uh, line of structures that are decorated with potential hydrogen bonding units. And so it's used for structural uh, materials. OK. No longer on a leash. I can wander around. OK. Uh, and so um, uh, this is uh, another brilliant concept of nature, using the OH bond, which, as you may remember, is only 5 kilocalories per mole, roughly, per bond. But if you start making a lot of them, then indeed uh, you get something that's very strong. And if you make a 1,000 of them as you go down the lines of, of such a polymer chain, then, of course, you have a 5,000 kilocalorie attraction between two strands. And if you do this, since the OH is on both sides of the, of the strand, uh, in a, in a two-dimensional, even three-dimensional way, you get an extremely rigid construct. And this is one of the things that uh, nature uses whoops, to, uh, to make to make rigid fibers and, uh, and the like, plant material and, and, and the like. So this is due to multiple hydrogen bonds. We'll see another brilliant application of this when we come to DNA, where DNA, the double helix, is held together by uh, millions and millions of hydrogen bonds. So this is also an extremely stable arrangement. Part of the brilliance of this is that at any given bond, it's only 5 kilocalories per mole. So it's an extremely flexible, in that respect, uh, structure with respect to one particular site. So enzymes and reagents can still go in and start nibbling away or do whatever they need to do locally while the, the three-dimensional arrangement of these constructs stays untouched. OK, so this is cellulose. So notice. It's the beta, um, hemi uh, the beta acetal oxygen. It's pointing up in cellulose. Now we see the, op the, the alternative. The alternative would be the go alpha, and nature uses that, and that's starch. Okay? So starch and cellulose are actually the same. 
if you wish, they're diastereomers of each other. Okay. In one case, it's the beta linkage. In the other case, it's the uh, um, uh, alpha linkage uh, down here at C1. So it's again uh, bo binding to another molecule of glucose at C4. This di uh, dimer here is actually a disaccharide called maltose, which you may, uh, um, it's in malt sugar, uh, which you may have heard about. Anyway, if you make a polymer of this, you get starch. So this is a polyglucose with alpha acetal links. And this is the fuel reserve that plants use. Okay? So the cellulose is uh, primarily used for structural material, uh, and this is for the fuel reserve. So this is the stuff that uh, uh, you'd like to stay away from if you're overweight and, and so on. Okay? It's in potatoes, wheat, rice, and so forth. So this then hydrolyzes using enzymes again and uh, uh, to glucose. And uh, an interesting experiment that some of you may have done accidentally uh, to do is to take a piece of bread, which is uh, a starch, and uh, keep it in your mouth for about a minute or uh, a little longer. And uh, as you do it, it, uh, it will develop a very sweet taste. Okay. The reason that it's doing that is because the enzymes in your mouth start hydrolyzing at the acetal linkage, and you make glucose. And glucose, of course, is, uh, is the sh has a sugar taste. So that's very, very sweet. So there are two major components of starch. One is amylose, which is the straight chain uh, uh, scenario. And then al uh, an alternative is amylopectin, which has branches. Okay? So the branching motif is also uh, used. Uh, I'm not a sugar expert, so I'm not quite sure why this is, except that Branching obviously has, uh, imparts different structural capabilities. Branching also, in principle, allows you to access multiple sites, um, multiple equal sites of the same uh, type of molecule. So you have uh, more capability to uh, uh, attack. Uh, look at the simple case butane. Butane has uh, two methyl groups, so if you were to be an enzyme that just prefers methyl groups. Butane has two of those sites. If you make the isomer, the branched form of butane, which is uh, um, the tertiobutane, the tertiobutyl group with a hydrogen attached to it, it's got three methyl groups, so you have more access, uh, if you wish. So that's amylopectin. And then the human fuel tank for immediate uh, fuel uh, access is called glycogen. But again, it's just the polymer of glucose. You don't have to remember this because this, uh, those of you who are going into biology and biochemistry will have to remember this. But uh, from a chemical standpoint, point, these are all just oligomers of glucose. Okay? There's more branching going on. The branches are longer in glycogen. And that apparently is essential for a now very quick production of as much glucose as possible because you have, because of the branching, many end groups and the enzymes actually start attacking at the non-reducing terminals of, at the end groups of these branches. And so obviously the more of those you have, the quicker you can uh, liberate glucose, and that's what you want. So you want a quick injection, fuel injection device, basically, of glycogen. So when you're very uh, exhausted after strenuous exercise, that's what's kicking in. And there's some brilliant mechanisms of, the, of these enzymes as they chew down the line. Okay? They start, start chewing away one glucose at a time. And then when they reach branching points, they do all kinds of interesting acrobatics, which is part, part of biochemistry. This stuff goes, uh, uh, is huge. Molecular weight goes up to 100 million. So that's a, a, a really enormous uh, type structure, basically a big blob with multiple sites on which you can chew away to liberate uh, glucose to give you, give you energy. Now, another feature of sugars, which I briefly touched upon in nature, which I briefly touched upon, upon in, in the introductory slide, is <coughs> it imparts water solubility to uh, assemblies, to structures, to molecules that are normally water insoluble. Since water is the solvent of life, in order to get reactivity, you've got to get stuff into a uh, solution. And we've done this ad infinitum. Uh, very f it's exceptional that you can get two things to react to e with each other by just 
grinding them up as a powder, although reactions like this are known. Uh, and so to get them into solution, to get something insoluble into solution, frequently what you do is you attach uh, an auxiliary group that is similar in structure, similar to the solvent that you want to, s to dissolve the stuff in, and uh, then it will go in. And so nature uses that by just attaching sugars to something that is biologically important. So I've just picked a couple of examples. Here's a class of molecules that are uh, used uh, extensively now worldwide. It's one of the primary weapons against cancer. It's the anthracyclines. And the anthracyclines have this structure. This is the active uh, part. Uh, it looks a little complex, but it really isn't. This is an anthracene frame, which is oxidized to the quinone frame. We've learned about quinones. And it's got next door uh, a benzene diol uh, or hydroquinone frame. And then the attached to this is a, is a cyclohexane that has uh, various oxygen functions in, in, in a specific stereochemistry. Uh, these compounds were uh, discovered uh, in the, I guess, 60s uh, by an Italian called Arcamone. And uh, the anti-cancer potential was recognized very early on. And part of the anti-cancer potential is that this quinone function acts essentially as an alkylating group. Remember that quinones can uh, react with nucleophiles. Uh, and uh, you can uh, attach things to them. So by a mechanism that I won't go into, it, it goes on to this position. It's the benzylic position that's, uh, that acts essentially as an alkylating group, so you can think of this as benzyl plus. And uh, alkylating agents, in principle, are, are dangerous uh, and are, can be carcinogenic or mutagenic because they can alkylate the bases of DNA. The bases of DNA have nitrogens that can be alkylated. You alkylate, and then in cell, in, in DNA replication, there is a, a mismatch, uh, an error in the chain. And that leads to misreading and leads to a mutation, most of which, 99.9999999% of which or more uh, lead to cell death, nothing happens. But every now and then, one of these mutations can lead evidently to, uh, to an event where the uh, cell machinery starts going berserk. Anyway, so this is insoluble. And so in order to get it soluble into water, the nature attaches the sugar. So this is basically just an auxiliary substituent. Notice that it is a uh, modified sugar with respect to our normal sugars. It's got no oxygen here, no hydroxy. So it's a deoxy sugar. Uh, it's still a, uh, a, a cyclic um, a heme or a cyclic acetal in this case. Notice here is the anomeric carbon or the acetal carbon, and it's attached as an acetal to this OH of the so-called A glycon, which is the other part of the, the sugar. Uh, and it's got an amino group. So uh, the OH has been replaced by um, uh, amine. So adriamycin is one of these compounds, has an OH here. Downomycin has an uh, H here. And it's used uh, particularly successful in the treatment, successfully in the treatment of solid uh, tumors. Uh, and I've seen pictures of this uh, in patients. Uh, it really is spectacular. You, you get an infusion of the stuff in quite, I mean, for medicines, large quantities, uh, hundreds of milligrams at the time. And you can see as you take, you know, a week later, two weeks later after treatment, you look at uh, the tumor, the tumor just shrinks away. Uh, so uh, mechanistically, very simply, uh, what happens here is the anthracycline intercalates, and here's a model of this, uh, into DNA. We'll see more of DNA in uh, the last few lectures. But it intercalates, and that also leads to uh, eventually cell death. Okay, so it's monk, uh, it, it, it screws around with uh, cell replication. And uh, by far the most, the, the basis for most cancer treatments is that Cancer cells replicate extremely rapidly compared to normal cells. And if you mess with the replication step, uh, you, uh, uh, you stop the growth of cancer cells much uh, successfully relative 
to the growth of normal cells, although most of these drugs also attack normal cells. So part of the principle is, uh, it's sort of a, a catch-22 in a way, uh, is to uh, hit the cancer cells with uh, poisons uh, because the cancer, or the cancer cells are susceptible to these poisons because they're hyperactive. and They multiply uh, considerably. Okay, uh, another example, which is basically, a, a, if you just look at it on first glance, looks like a, tr a trisaccharide in which you have a uh, um, uh, furanose sugar attached at the beta, with the beta acetyl hydroxy to what looks like a semi-glucose molecule, except we have nitrogen here and here, nitrogen substitution attached to another acetyl carbon uh, of another molecule that looks like a normal sugar. But there's some interesting differences. Okay? This furanose here actually has an aldehyde sitting off here and a methyl here. Okay? Looks like there has been an intramolecular redox uh, process because you really want to have an alcohol here uh, and an alcohol here also. Uh, this guy, while on first sight looks like a sugar, is actually a cyclohexane. So nature, there's a mimicry going on here. Uh, this obviously is a much more stable assembly because it's actually all carbon six-membered ring. Uh, still adopts the chair configuration, and nature for some reason thought that this was advantageous. Uh, and down here we have again a nitrogen hanging off here, and there's certain aspects of the, of the uh, um, stereochemistry are interesting. Perhaps uh, very interesting is that this molecule uses an L-glucose rather than D-glucose. So the statement that all natural sugars are D is not quite right. Most of them are D. Every now and then, nature picks the opposite, an antimer, uh, to uh, impart uh, whatever uh, activity it wants. So this guy is called streptomycin, which you may have heard about. Uh, it's also a powerful antibiotic uh, uh, reagent. And this one binds to the ribosome, uh, which is the uh, ribosome is the, uh, is the enzyme, as so this blob indicated here, that's responsible for um, assembling, um, assembling uh, amino acids to peptides. Okay. So it's a very important piece in cell replication. So again, misreading of genetic information leading to cell death. A lot of these interfere with this uh, DNA replication business that we'll look at uh, next week. Okay, so, so much for the sugars. Now let's move on to another class of compounds or summarize what we've learned already about another class of compounds and expand a little bit on them, and that is heterocycles. So heterocycles are called such to distinguish them from carbocycles, which are rings based purely on carbon. Heterocycles are carbocycles in which one or several carbons have been replaced by a heteroatom. And for organic chemistry, by, by and large, the heteroatoms we're talking about are nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, maybe phosphorus. Uh, and that uh, forms by far the largest uh, uh, fraction of uh, heterocyclic molecules. A really good one is shown here. You've all, you all know this one, and you've eaten that stuff, uh, at least those of you who are coffee drinkers. Uh, frequently, uh, it's the, this section here starts, this is from the fifth edition, but how many of you can do with, uh, without the morning cup of coffee? Okay, so uh, this is the heterocycle caffeine that is responsible for the uh, physiological activity uh, of uh, coffee. And you notice it's got uh, one ring here with two nitrogens in it, another ring here with another two nitrogens in it, a bunch of double bonds, there's a carbonyl here, and just some methyl group. Pretty simple molecule. It is somewhat reminiscent of uh, a benzene ring, this ring, except that two of the carbons have been replaced by nitrogen, and it's a benzene ring that would have two carbonyl functions attached to it. And this one is a rather special ring, it's called a pyrrole, uh, which has two double bonds here and here, and there's a nitrogen, which as it turns out has a lone electron pair 
that participates in cyclic delocalization. So we'll learn about that kind of aromaticity uh, a little later on. So our normal eight ounce uh, serving has 135 milligrams of caffeine. I spent the sabbatical in the fall of uh, 2004, about a year and a half ago, in Rome. So I learned to really appreciate Roman espresso. Uh, and uh, that has 100 milligrams of caffeine in less than an ounce of liquid. In fact, Roman coffee is famous for the fact that it's just a tiny amount. You basically just take the forerun of the high pressure liquid chromatography extraction of coffee. And uh, when you taste that, it is an incredible jolt to your system. So uh, very few of you have uh, had that kind of uh, an espresso. But you can, uh, you can get it even at uh, Roma's uh, uh, or any of the uh, stores by watching them and tell them to take the cup away after about five seconds of water going out of the espresso machine. So you could try that as an experiment after lecture. OK. I don't know whether you can see that. It's a little big. But uh, there is a table. Well, this one is updated. Uh, there's an older table in your book. Uh, it illustrates the point. Uh, by far, the largest proportion of all drugs, all medicines that we take, have heterocycles in them. So the heterocyclic motif is extremely important uh, for two reasons. One is recognition. Uh, the lone pairs of these heterocycles are very important to, uh, uh, in terms of pi basicity or in terms of basicity, uh, lone pair basicity, to attach themselves uh, to active sites and the like. And they're also important for uh, activity with respect to reactivity, because the heteroatom uh, uh, makes the systems reactive. So as of 2003, so this is already outdated to some extent. Uh, this changes all the time. These are the top 10 US uh, drugs. As of 2003, I think this is still uh, actually number one, uh, Lipitor. This is the ranking, one through five and six through 10. Lipitor or, or atorvastatin uh, is a cholesterol reducer. Cholesterol reducing agents have been the, uh, the big craze in the last 10 years, huge money makers. Uh, I think Lipitor is now well over $8 billion uh, uh, drug. Uh, and notice it's got benzene rings attached. Here's an amid bond. Here's some uh, hydroxies attached in a stereochemically defined uh, manner, a carboxy group. And here's the heterocycle. Here's again this bi membered ring, two double bonds and a nitrogen uh, whose lone electron pair contributes to aromaticity. So this is an aromatic ring. Uh, number two uh, was uh, Prilosec. Uh, that's an anti-ulcer agent. Right. So here's a heterocycle. Notice that this looks very much like that, except that it's got now two nitrogens on it. And here's a ring that looks like benzene, except one of the carbons is nitrogen. This also, this is called pyridine. We've seen pyridine before, actually, as a mild base. We've used it in, uh, in, uh, in, in order to mop up HCl in, in various uh, substitution reactions and the like. Uh, it's also aromatic. Okay? And then there's an ether hanging off here, and there's a sulfonyl group, and so on. Uh, this one's called uh, Zocor. You may have heard about this one. This is another anti uh, uh, cholesterol, it's another cholesterol reducer. And here's the heterocycle. This one is a lactone het heterocycle. So it's a, a, a cyclohexane in which one of the carbons has become an oxygen. Notice that, you know, rather, some of these. This one is very simple compared to that one in terms of stereochemistry. Uh, so synthetically, to make this is much more difficult than, uh, than that. It's got one, two, three, four, five stereocenters, six stereocenters, seven, seven stereocenters. So uh, that's a quite intricate molecule, and, and the stereocenters are all bulked up uh, quite a bit. Um, Norvask is an anti-hypertensive, uh, another six-membered ring uh, 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 nitrogen uh, cycle. This one looks like pyridine, except it's got two hydrogens attached to it, so it's a dihydropyridine. 
more like a cyclohexadiene in which one carbon is replaced by nitrogen. Here's again another ultra agent. Notice the motif. In fact, all of these compounds basically either treat cholesterol or ulcers or tension. And ulcers and tensions are related to each other. It's sort of a, a reflection of modern society. That these are the prime ailments that uh, we are afflicted uh, with. That's called Prevacid. Uh, this is uh, Cyprexa, I guess. Uh, that's an anti, uh, what is that? Is that an antihypertensive? I can't read this. Celebrex, you all uh, have heard about, is an antiarthritis compound. Very, very successful. Here's one, here's an exception. This drug here, which uh, snuck up in 2003 as one of the uh, 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 big sellers is actually a polypeptide, 165 amino acids, uh, and that's an anti-anemic uh, compound. This one is well known, Paxil, an antidepressant. Here's the heterocycle. Here's another heterocycle. And finally, Biox, uh, that used to be a very successful antiarthritic compound, and then it was withdrawn in 2004. And you hear about that a lot because there are all kinds of lawsuits uh, because of the side effects heart attack, things like that, that it's alleged to uh, be associated with. So heterocycles are really, really important structures in medicinal chemistry. So let's look at some of the namings. It's actually quite simple. Uh, there are cyclic molecules that contain at least one heteroatom, so O, N, and S are prevalent, especially O and N. And so what you do is you just use the prefix oxa, aza, or thia, or phospha, uh, in front of the cycloalkane. So it's an oxacyclopropane, or an oxacyclohexane, uh, and so forth. To indicate this is, contains oxygen, aza to, for nitrogen, thia for sulfur, phospha for phosphorus, titana if it's a titanium heterocycle, which we won't talk about. But it's the same principle. So here's oxacyclopropane, common name is oxyrane or ethylene oxide, uh, that's the three-membered ring uh, oxygen compound. Here's a nitrogen compound, it's called an azacyclopropane, and when you have substituents on it, and the, uh, on the nitrogen, it's an N-methyl azacyclopropane. So we're using the same N-alkyl nomenclature that we used for uh, amines and then amines. Uh, here is a thiacyclopropane. Uh, substituents uh, are uh, labeled with the position that they're in, and uh, the numbering always starts at the heteroatom. Okay, so the heteroatom is atom one. So this is atom one, this is atom one, this one's one, and so fluorine in this compound is at position two. So this is two fluoro. Thiacyclopropane, and if it had stereochemistry indicated, you would have to name label it ROS. This is an oxacyclobutane, and uh, this is an azacyclobutane at three position. We've got ethyl, so it's three ethyl azacyclobutane. This is two two dimethyl thiacyclobutane. This is an oxacyclopentane, common name is tetrahydrofuran. The basic stem without substituents is used as a solvent, THF. If you use that at infinitum as a solvent, it's basically a diethyl ether solvent in which you bend back the backbone and made a bond to make it cyclic. So it's a cyclic form of diethyl ether. And uh, pulling back the ethyl groups from diethyl ether exposes the oxygen lone pairs more than us usual, and so THF is actually an excellent so ether solvent for that purpose because if it's, if it's so, uh, uh, dissolving compounds by using the oxygen lone pairs. For example, in Grignard formation. Grignard reagents are MGX. The magnesium is uh, electron deficient. So Grignards, as you may recall, can only be made in ether solvent because they pick up four electrons, two pairs, from the ether solvent. So this at 3 and 4 has two bromines, and it's trans, so this is trans 3, 4, dibromo, oxacyclopentane, and here's azacyclopentane. 
thiacyclopentane, and now for six-membered drinks, it's just cyclohexane. So this is 3-methyl oxacyclohexane. Common name is pyrene for this, or tetrahydropyrene. Remember, this is the stem we use for the name pyranose, just like the 5-membered ring ether, the furan name, was used for furanose. Azocyclohexane, common name piperidine, and so on. Now we come to the aromatic version of the heterocycles, and this is uh, relatively new. Okay. So if you have a five-membered ring and you put in uh, from tetrahydrofuran and you put in the double bond, uh, you now have two conjugated double bonds, and there's an oxygen that has two lone electron pairs. One of those pairs is, is used for cyclic conjugation, as we'll see later. So this is, becomes aromatic. It's a cyclic, delocalized, six-electron frame. Same thing for this guy. This guy is called thiophene. So uh, this one's called furan. So now we're really switching to common names because uh, IUPAC nomenclature is a little lengthy. Uh, this one you would have to call an, an oxacyclopentadiene on a thiocyclopentadiene, so the common names are firmly entrenched. So this is thiophene. This guy is a benzene in which one carbon is replaced by nitrogen, so it's called pyridine. Notice that the lone pair in pyridine is perpendicular to the pi frame, so here, unlike these two systems, the lone pair is not involved. Nitrogen is just normally sp2 hybridized like carbon would be, and it's it donates one electron perpendicular to the frame of the molecule to make the six electron uh, frame. It's completely identical to benzene. Benzene would have a carbon here and an electron pair in the plane. That electron pair, because carbon is to the left of nitrogen, would, be, would have to be, to keep carbon neutral, would have to be capped off by hydrogen. So it's a CH is replaced by N. Here's a benzo derivative that's called quinoline. So this is a, an aza na, uh, analog of naphtalin. It's, in fact, one aza naphtalin. Uh, this guy is a benzo uh, um, five-membered ring compound. Uh, it's called indole and so forth. So there are a bunch of these compounds in which you have cyclic delocalization. We'll see some more of these uh, a little later. In this chapter, we'll see more of these guys in chapter uh, in the last chapter because uh, these kinds of structures are the basic frame of uh, the DNA basis or nucleic acid basis in general. So this one actually is added in. It is one of the bases. Okay, how do we make these? Brief review. We know how to do that. The best way is intramolecular SN2 reaction. So for ethers, for cyclic ethers, for oxacycloalkanes, this would be the intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis, chapter 9. This is the reaction on which we learned the rates, the rules for the rates for ring closure. Three-membered ring, fastest, four-membered ring, slowest, five, faster again, and six, faster again. And the, 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 uh, the interplay between entropy and ring strain as you do this. So you just take uh, the, uh, a, a, an open chain compound that has a leaving group at some point, and you have the heteroatom that has a, a lone electron pair. Typically, it's used as the anion. Obviously, that makes it an even better nucleophile. And then you do an intramolecular displacement, and that makes the cycle. One special reaction we learned for oxacyclopropanes. Remember, this was the oxacyclopropanation. Uh, chapter 12 with peroxycarboxylic acids. Peroxycarboxylic acids basically transfer an oxygen to the double bond. They do so stereospecifically in a one, cent, one concerted transition state uh, to uh, starting with trans, you get trans, starting with cis, you get cis. What sort of reactions do they do? Well, we know about that already also. When the rings are strained, uh, then uh, you can do nucleophilic ring opening. When they're not strained, they're really quite unreactive. Uh, so uh, either you, uh, you 
you just don't, nothing happens to them, or you have to beat on them to make something happen. So three and four membered rings open up. So here is a case, phenyl, uh, two phenyl oxacyclopropane, you treat it with alkoxide or any nucleophilic uh, type reagents, alkyl lithium, Grignard reagents, methyl sulfide, and so on. Ring opening will occur, and you get the uh, OH backing off here. So this is one of those cases where the leaving group stays attached to the molecule. Uh, and the methoxy has come in. So this is, these are high yield reactions. Uh, here is an uh, ASA, th this one we haven't seen before, but uh, the nitrogen free membered ring compounds are also reactive. The ring strain, remember, is on the order of 28 kilocalories per mole. So they're like loaded springs, and so ring opening will occur. So even nitrogen functions as a leaving group, although uh, nitrogen is a much worse leaving group than oxygen. Remember, nitrogen is to the left from oxygen. Uh, oxygen is much more electronegative. So oxygen pulls on this bond much more than this nitrogen does. But because of the ring strain, it's still reactive enough to cause this opening. And so now the nucleophile I'm using is an amine. And this works nice. Although notice, we do have to bead on it a little bit. So this is much, much slower than this. This goes at room temperature fast. This you have to do 120 degrees, 16 days, but the yield is good. Oh, sorry, here's the yield. So this is 70% amine in water. And you get the ring opening. So this gives you a vicinal, as it's called, diamine. Four membered ring compounds also open up. Uh, we haven't done much of that. And part of the reason for that is that to make the four-membered ring compounds is more, much more difficult than the three-membered ring. And that has to do with the fact that the intramolecular Williamson synthesis for making oxacyclobutanes is the slowest. And so there are complications. Remember, it's an intramolecular SN2. If the SN2 slows down for whatever reason, this is now globally speaking, other things happen usually elimination. So you start seeing side reactions. Since you can't make these as easily as these, uh, we've seen less of this chemistry. But the principle is the same. They actually do the same kind of uh, uh, reaction. And so with an amine, 150 degrees, bang, you open up. Yield's not that great. So these ring openings are usually done under basic conditions. But we've learned for oxycyclopropanes especially, acidic ring opening uh, is possible. And so what happens here is that you are protonating first. That turns the uh, oxygen into OH, which is a much better leaving group than O minus. And now, under acidic conditions, it's the neutral nucleophile that attacks. Normally, the, no the neutral nucleophile is not hard enough to attack if it's a uh, uh, nucleophilic oxygen to attack. But in the previous slide, we saw that uh, a neutral amine is nucleophilic enough to ring open uh, oxacyclopropanes, although you have to heat. So here under city conditions, you protonate. And remember that uh, now, because of this protonated species, we have a full positive charge here. Charge control takes over, uh, as opposed to basic conditions. Under basic conditions, the SN2 follows the rule for S rules for SN2. The less substituted carbon is attacked for steric reasons. Here, it's the more substituted carbon that's attacked because it's got more positive charge. So this was an exception. Acidic type ring openings are generally uh, used less. The simple reason being that whenever you have acid around, if there is a chance of doing carbocation chemistry, uh, it, it will find it. And you know that carbocation chemistry is really basically a disaster unless the system is very well defined. So carbocation chemistry means SN1 and E1 rearrangements, polymerizations, and the like. OK, so for rings that are larger than four, unstrained rings, relatively unstrained rings, these guys are really stable. So this is THF. THF is rock stable. That's why it's used as a solvent. And so you have to beat on this. And uh, so synthetically, this is not used uh, much. Uh, it's more interesting from a, from
from a, prep, from a mechanistic point of view, if anything. So you have to treat this with boiling uh, hydrobromic acid. HBr is a very, very strong acid. Uh, so this is strong enough to protonate here. And then on the, when you heat, you do nucleophilic this ring opening. So it first makes this. And under the conditions, this alcohol uh, uh, gets protonated again, and bromide displaces it, so you get the dibromide. But because of these rough conditions, you wouldn't, I mean, you couldn't do this to a sugar ether, for example. It would just completely chew up the sugar, turn it into a black goo. Okay, now what about uh, the corresponding ring opening for the nitrogen analogs? Uh, you can't do that. Just for the same reason that you can't convert an amine, an ordinary amine, the um, amino group in an amine, into uh, an ammonium leaving group by just protonation. You can protonate it and it makes the ammonium species, but that ammonium species just sits there. So ammonia as a leaving group is not as good as water as a leaving group. What you can do for alcohols, protonation, which turns OH into H2O, and then making it leave, uh, uh, what, uh, what is feasible there is, is not possible for nitrogen. Why? Well, again, oxygen is much more of a polar. So it's intrinsically a much better leaving group. So if you take this guy and, uh, and you argue, well, I'm going to ring open this with HBr, concentrated HBr, just like I ring opened the corresponding ether, it won't work. It'll just protonate and it'll make the salt and just sit there. But we know a way to turn, one way, to turn the uh, uh, nitrogen into a leaving group, and that's by alkylation. And that's the so-called Hofmann degradation. Okay? So you can methylate it, which is, would be the, the uh, equivalent uh, operation to protonating, uh, and permethylate. So you use excess methyl iodide that puts two methyls on here and makes the dimethyl ammonium salt. And it's that guy in the presence of silver oxide that then undergoes an elimination, an E2. Okay. So we don't use this for SN2 chemistry. We just use it for elimination. And that works. So two methyls here. Base. Base pulls off this proton, puts in a double bond here. The leaving group leaves. Here it is left, and here's the double bond. And if you do it again, you put in another double bond in here. So this step methylates here, makes the ammonium salt, which makes it a reasonable leaving group, not as good as protonated oxygen, uh, but reasonable enough that uh, a strong base so using silver oxide uh, deprotonates here and does E2. Remember, silver oxide is nothing else but silver hydroxide. AGOH. It's related to sodium hydroxide and sodium oxide. Na2O, when you add water to it, makes NaOH. So this is just a reagent that uses, that's used to generate Ag silver OH, so hydroxide. And so it's hydroxide as a strong base. And silver is particularly use, useful here because it complexes to the nitrogen. So it helps. It helps to pull off the leaving group uh, as well as to uh, uh, supply the base that eliminates it. That's a special feature of this Hofmann degradation. So other chemistry is the same as for the acyclic system. To remind you of a couple of these, for example, secondary amines. Remember, uh, you can make the N-nitroso compounds uh, by just uh, uh, using nitric acid, nitrous acid. So this is typically done by using sodium nitrite, NaNO2, in the presence of some HCl. That makes this, which is a source of NO+. And NO+, attacks the lone pair, and then you deprotonate and you make this. Uh, these n nitrosa amines, when they derive from secondary amines, are stable. Remember when they derive from primary amines, where you have a hydrogen sitting on here, it starts rearranging and eventually make N2 and the carbocation. And for tertiary amines, of course, uh, uh, you, you can make the N-nitrosonium salts, but it doesn't go anywhere. Okay. 
So in nitroso compounds, for these sulfides, we've seen that. That goes back to chapter 9. I don't know if you remember this, but sulfides can be oxidized to the sulfoxides and then all the way to the sulfone. Sulfur being in the third row here, uh, there's valence shell expansion, one way to think about it. Or if you don't like that, you just write the dipolar resonance forms with plus on sulfur, minus on oxygen. That keeps you in the octet uh, range. So that's just done with hydrogen peroxide. So sulfides are unstable in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, and they can be oxidized to the sulfoxides. And then we can methylate. That makes the sulfonium salt. OK. So now what is new is this special feature of these cyclically delocalized ESA or heterocyclopentadienes. We'll do that after the break. So perhaps the best way to look at these compounds is to compare them to cyclopentadienyl anions. That was one of the compounds where we noticed that uh, you can expand the 4n plus 2 rule to incorporate charge systems if they have an uh, odd number of carbon atoms. So remember, this guy was derived from cyclopentadiene, which had two double bonds here and two hydrogens here. And we know the cyclopentadiene, the pKa was on the order of 15.5, extraordinarily low. It's, it has a pKa of, uh, that's uh, the same as methanol. Okay? So methoxide will pull off that proton, for example. Uh, and tertiary butoxide will pull it off uh, such that the equilibrium is a, a thousandfold to the right. Uh, why? Because uh, when you pull off an electron uh, a proton from here, you leave an electron pair here, and that starts to enter into conjugation with the other two double bonds. So it's the two electrons on one carbon that starts delocalizing. And you can write resonance structures that put th these two electrons here, 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 and here. So on average, there is an excess electron density distributed over all five carbons. So you have six electrons distributed over five carbons, 1.2 electrons, as it were, per carbon. And that imparts stability to this thing because it's a cyclically delocalized six-electron frame. So the picture that we used for uh, uh, CP anion, cyclopentadienyl anion, was this. Completely symmetrical structure, as shown by X-ray. And indeed, it's, uh, uh, the, the charge is distributed evenly. So that all carbon bonds are the same. All CHs are the same. In the NMR spectrum, it's a uh, nice singlet, okay? as opposed to cyclopentadiene, which is uh, sort of a reasonable mess, because it's got three different types of hydrogens, and they're all coupled to each other. Okay? Uh, so when you uh, replace one of these carbons with a heteroatom as in uh, the next compound, which is called pyrrole. Now, we don't need a, a, a hydrogen that's, uh, oh, sorry, that, that you replace CH2 with NH. Okay. And so now we have a nitrogen here. And uh, I should put in the hydrogen again. Sorry. Here you go. Now think of this as a nitrogen atom. Okay. And there are two electrons in here, just like in the cyclopentadienyl anion, but they are part of the nitrogen lone pair. And so now we are neutral, because nitrogen is trivalent. And it's this electron pair that starts delocalizing with these guys. Now, and that imparts aromaticity. But because nitrogen is a different atom from carbon, of course, the system is not completely symmetrical anymore. Okay, so there's slight asymmetry in it. 
But nevertheless, it tries to symmetrize structurally so that it's trying to make all the bonds the same. So this is a shorter bond than you would have expected for a normal amine carbon. And these bonds are slightly longer for a full double bond. And this bond is slightly shorter again. So you're trying to, to delocalize the bonds and you're trying to avoid bond alternation. You can't completely avoid it because nitrogen is a completely different atom from carbon. The electronegativities are, are different and so forth. And the symmetry of the system, of course, has also uh, been lifted. But nevertheless, this compound called pyrrole has unusual stability associated with it because of the cyclic delocalization. You can see this sort of in, this, in the electrostatic potential maps. Uh, here, the red area of the delocalized uh, uh, system is distributed nicely, evenly over the uh, five carbon system. And here, it's sort of also distributed. Here, down here is the nitrogen, so the H is down here, perpendicular to this frame. It's also fairly evenly distributed over uh, uh, the five atom system here. Same thing holds for furan and thiophene. In the case of furan and thiophene, because we are further to the right even than pyrrole, we don't even need a hydrogen here. So now we have two lone pairs. But notice the oxygen and sulfur, which we typically always thought as sort of semi-sp3 hybridized, if they're hybridized at all, now it prefers sp2 hybridization because that puts one electron pair, one lone electron pair, smack into a p-like orbital that is perfectly aligned to delocalize. And the other electron pair is just sitting there in a sp2-like uh, uh, orbital sticking out in space. So this is, again, the manifestation of the powerful driving force of aromaticity that imparts special stability to these molecules. And so by all criteria, uh, the heat of formation data, structural data, uh, and as we'll see in a minute, also NMR data, which is perhaps the most useful for a practicing organic chemist, we have a ring current in all of these, which, uh, which de-shield the alkenyl hydrogens uh, move them to the left, just like uh, as, uh, in benzene. There's another feature that imparts special reactivity of these, particularly in electrophilic aromatic substitutions. Uh, and that is, a, that is sort of related to the extreme example of this, namely the cyclopentadienyl anion. If you have six electrons distributed over five carbons, as opposed to benzene, six electrons over six, per carbon you have much more electron density. On, on each carbon. And the same thing is true here. If this electron pair really kicks into the delocalized pi frame, then we are adding electron density to the delocalized pi frame. And so these, all these guys are relatively electron rich relative to benzene. So they all undergo electrophilic aromatic substitution faster than uh, benzene does, uh, even though we are talking, particularly in these two cases, about atoms that are more electronegative than carbon, so that inductively, they're actually slightly withdrawing. But because a full electron pair is given into the system to cause the cyclic delocalization, the pi frame is electron rich. So electrophilic aromatic substitution is good. OK, just looking at these orbitals, of what I just did with the model, but pointing out the, uh, uh, the nitrogen more clearly, uh, uh, you can see here is the five atom frame uh, as opposed to cyclopentadienyl anion, which would have a carbon here. We have now nitrogen with a lone electron pair sitting here, and there's an uh, NH bond, and this electron pair is donated into this frame. If you look at furan and thiophene, now we have one to the right in the periodic table. Oxygen and sulfur is divalent in these cases. So we have two ele lone electron pairs. Notice that X hybridizes to sp2. And so this is a p orbital that's delocalized with these four electrons. And then there is another electron pair and an sp2 hybrid. So the hybridization changes somewhat around these atoms. 
to facilitate cyclic delocalization. You can do this also by uh, doing resonance structures. In the case of benzene, it was pretty simple because we had two equivalent resonance forms, uh, the cyclohexatrine and the two possible arrangements. Uh, here it's a little bit more intricate because you're starting out with a neutral, uh, and, uh, uh, but one of the atoms, the nitrogen in this case, donates a full electron pair in the next resonance form as you move electrons around. That makes it positively charged. And conversely, the receiving carbon end becomes negatively charged. So you get dipolar structures. So starting from here, for example, to go all around the ring, that puts a plus here, the double bonds here, and the negative charge here. Uh, you can move this electron pair in here and this electron pair out. That gives you this dipolar structure, which is equivalent to that, obviously. Uh, left versus right carbon bears the negative charge. Uh, and then you can do it again. It puts the negative charge here, and then again puts it here. So you can have the negative charge all around uh, the, uh, the ring on, on each carbon when the positive charge is on nitrogen. So again, this indicates that donating this electron pair into the system in, in principle puts negative charge on all of, the all of the carbon atoms. And that makes them, these carbon atoms, relatively electron rich relative to benzene. So this shows up in NMR also. Uh, in NMR, because of the intrinsic asymmetry, of course, we have three types of hydrogen. There's the NH hydrogen. And that, remember, NH, like OH, and to some extent SH, is pretty variable. It depends on how wet your solvent is, what the temperature is on hydrogen bonding and the like. Uh, in this case, it's broad, so it's, it's broadened typically, and so it's broad here too, and it shows up at around 8. Uh, but the other two are very nicely resolved. Okay? So this hydrogen and this hydrogen, they're coupled to each other, so you see some splitting, and uh, uh, one is at lower field than the other. Uh, and uh, one that's at slightly higher field, they're both close, and they're both deshielded, by the way, so they're uh, relative to a normal alkenyl hydrogen, which would be more on the regime over here. Uh, and uh, the alpha hydrogen, or the hydrogen at position two, is more deshielded than the beta, and that has to do with. Uh, a, the dominance of the resonance form in which the nitrogen pair kicks in and puts in a negative charge here, the enamine type resonance form. So we can view this, ignoring now the cyclic delocalization, in a more localized uh, picture as an enamine, amine group attached to a double bond. And remember, enamines, we use them as masked enolates. That is, we use the fact that these were neutral compounds in which the electron pair donates such that the beta carbon becomes electron rich, and we use that for alkylation. So, so no, in normal enamines, you can alkylate at this position. That gives you an imine cation, which we then hydrolyze to the carbonyl. And that allowed us to alkylate alpha to a carbonyl, avoiding the problems of enolate basicity. So if you just focus on this resonance form that puts a delta minus here, that shields this hydrogen slightly relative to this one. OK, so we got two effects here, by the way, uh, that uh, are fighting each other with respect to chemical shifts. One is the relative electron richness of these two carbons. Making a carbon electron rich means that the hydrogen attached to that carbon has a vicinity that's relatively electron rich. Remember, relative electron richness means shielding. So if you make something very electron rich, it moves to the right. If you make it electron poor, it moves to the left. Electron withdrawing groups move a signal to the left. So the electron richness moves these guys to the right. The aromaticity moves them to the left. So overall, aromaticity clearly wins. And it, these guys, or to put it differently, these guys, based on the ring current effect, would be even further to the left, where benzene is. Uh, but they're slightly not, not quite as far to the left due to the aromaticity because of the electron richness, which goes the opposite way. So 
clearly they're aromatic. That's the bottom line, based on the NMR criteria. So the same thing shows up in uh, carbon. Now, carbon is not as diagnostic of uh, ring currents because the chemical shift window in carbon is way larger, and the ring current effect is only 1 to 2.5 ppm. Moreover, the ring current, as it were, flows over the carbons, so it's not really, sometimes not clear to, to d define in which it would, uh, the, the carbons lie in the shielding or deshielding uh, zone of the ring current, the local magnetic field. In fact, it's the first approximation, they're right in the neutral zone. So ring currents are not diagnostic for C13. Okay. So that's in a way okay, because then you can focus more on charge effect. So again, the charge effect uh, shields these guys somewhat, and the beta carbon is shielded more than the alpha carbon. And they show up in the range a little higher field than a normal alkenal uh, carbon, but not, not very largely. Normal alkenals are between 120 and 140. Okay. So they're in that regime. And the beta is more shielded than the alpha. Mass spec. We now know how to do mass spec. So this guy shows a nice parent ion. The parent ion is odd. Uh, and that's the unusual feature of nitrogen uh, because it's trivalent. So you get an odd molecular ion. It's exactly at 67. And indeed, it's the base peak. It's 100% peak. Then there's fragmentation. Uh, when you blast this with, uh, you know, 1,200 or whatever, 1,600 kilocalories per mole, it does fall apart. Uh, you can see that it seems to like to, to break these bond, this bond here. Uh, to kick out cyanide, this is cyanide or CN, and this is HCN, and this is protonated HCN, looks like. Okay, so th this thing seems to break here and then... Uh, then it starts falling apart by making cyanide. The CN triple bond is a very stable unit, so it likes to fall apart in this manner. IR. IR is pretty uneventful, except that, of course, in pyrrole we have an NH bond, so the NH bond shows up around uh, 3,400, and there it is. Very strong band. The rest of it is basically fingerprint. So how do we make these things? There is a general way of making all of these guys, and that is by a condensation reaction that involves a 1,4-dicarbonyl uh, compound. Okay. So these two carbonyl functions in a 1,4 uh, relationship. And uh, it's called the Paul Knorr synthesis for pyrroles, and people have then extended it. So variations of the Paul Knorr synthesis work for all of them. Okay? And basically, what you do is you take this dicarbonyl function, treat it either with an amine that makes the pyrroles, or phosphorus pentoxide, which is basically just a dehydrating agent. Phosphorus pentoxide eventually leads to phosphoric acid. It's the anhydride of phosphoric acid. It's very hygroscopic. It reacts quite violently with water. So it wants to pick up water, and it rips out two water molecules from this, and that makes furan. And you'll see in a minute how it does that. P2S5 is just a sulfur analog uh, of phosphorus pentoxide. It's the anhydride of thiophosphoric acid, also hygroscopic, wants to be hydrated. It rips out water where it can. So it's these three reagents that do this. So let me give you an example. If you treat this dicarbonyl compound uh, with uh, P2O5, out comes dimethyl furan. How does that go? So I'm spelling it out for you here, here in step by step. First of all, Carbonyls can always be in equilibrium with the enols. Indeed, under these conditions, phosphorus pentoxide is the anhydride of phosphoric acid. There's always a, a little bit of acid around, period. So the acid catalyzes, and I'm doing two steps in one go, the, uh, the enol formation. So you protonate on the carbonyl, deprotonate here. That makes the enol. Remember, that equilibrium is fast. 
basically a, a, a tautomerization from the keto form to the enol form. Equilibrium is on the left, but you make it a little bit of this, and that's crucial. Now, this can be protonated again, off and on, and that activates this carbon with respect to nucleophilic attack. So that protonation makes this susceptible to attack by this OH. Notice that this is nothing else but hemiacetal formation. Carbonyl is attacked by al alcohol. Just happens to be the alcohol of an enol. Okay. So the enol attacks here. That makes the uh, hemiacetal still protonated. That's the first species that's formed. Then you lose proton. That would make the hemiacetal period. Then you reprotonate here. So I'm writing these without writing the intermediate neutral species. So essentially, this proton jumps from here to here. But it does so by coming off and then back on. That turns this OH into a good leaving group. Okay, so the leaving group re leaves. That makes this guy. And then you lose a proton to make the double bond. This step normally, in the presence of an alcohol, would make the acetal. But in this case, you're deprotonating because the driving force is to make the aromatic furan. Overall, what are we doing here? We're losing two molecules of water uh, in this step uh, to turn this guy into this guy. Sorry, one molecule of water. Losing one molecule of water, I take it back here it is, to dehydrate basically this dion to make the corresponding uh, tetrahydrofuran. So topologically, it's, it's a dehydration which is affected by the dehydrating agent phosphoric acid. All right, so here's an example P205, 150 degrees, 62%, you get this fused furan. Uh, here's another example, the, uh, this dion here. Now with P2S5, same reaction. You heat it up, it dehydrates it, but uh, in this case, you have sulfur. Sulfur replaces the oxygen in this step, and you get the corresponding thiophane. So this is the same reaction that we just did with P2O5, which put oxygen here. With P2S5, it put sulfur here. How does that go? Well, it goes through converting the carbonyls into the thiocarbonyl. So P2S5 exchanges carbonyl for thiocarbonyl. It does that in a sort of simplified ma manner. Here's P2S5 uh, in an abbreviated form, uh, similar to P2O5. So you can replace all of these by oxygen. That's the same thing. Notice that if you hydrate this, you get the thio analog of H3PO4, namely H3PS4, thiophosphoric acid. The exchange occurs basically because this is very electrophilic, okay? so a lot of delta plus on this because of the polarization of the PS bonds. So it, it attacks here, and I've written it sort of in an intramolecular manner. Attacking here makes this plus, so this makes, makes this uh, electrophilic, so Actually, a sulfur from another molecule of this comes in and attacks with sulfur here. And then you just, by the reverse, kick out oxygen. So it's easy to exchange oxygen for sulfur by the sulfur attacking here and then the oxygen leaving uh, later. That turns the ketone into the thio ketone. Then this behaves just like a ketone. It makes the enol. So this is the enthiol. And the enthiol then reacts by making the thiohemiacetal analog of the hemiacetal. So the mechanism is the same. The crucial piece is that oxygen is exchanged for sulfur. Finally, do the same thing with, uh, with an amine. For example, this, again, dion with the amine makes the corresponding pyrrole. If you have a we have ammonia would make the, the parent of pyrrol with, with primary amine. You get the alkylated uh, pyrrol. And this also goes through a similar form, uh, a similar mechanism as the other guys. Now we have nitrogen. Nitrogen comes in 
and first makes the enamine, just like the carbonyls make the enol and the thiol carbonyls make the enthiol. And it's the enamine that then attacks, makes the nitrogen analog of the hemiaminal, and then you keep on going. The driving force in all cases is aromaticity of the ring. So it's one reaction applicable to all three heterocyclic systems. We'll talk some more about this on Thursday. Thank you.